What if she dies? This is a good theme to talk about. What if she dies? Because uh, I was actually having a conversation with um, a trainee who uh, mentioned that this idea, like, like, well, you know, what if my, in her case, my mom, who I'm disconnecting from, what if she were to pass? And then uh, I just don't know what I would do. She said, I just don't know. And that tends to be the sentiment that a lot of us feel. We just don't know uh, how we would handle it if the person that we disconnected from in an effort to keep ourselves healthy, safe, because they were toxic or abusive in any way. Uh, if they pass, we don't know what we would do. Uh, perhaps we have fears. Maybe we have fears that we would feel guilty. Maybe we fear that if we were to cut them off and uh, not be in contact with them closely anymore, and then suddenly they were to pass away, we would be racked with guilt. We would feel uh, so, so hurt, so much pain, so much regret. We would say, no, if only I had one more day, one more hour with that person. Perhaps we're thinking, there's so many things I would have wanted to say. There's so many things I would have wanted to do. But ultimately, we just don't know how we'd feel, how we'd handle it. Perhaps we can remember in the past when someone uh, that we love died, uh, we became very distraught. Um, so when we're looking at this subject, uh, we want to take a moment to step back now before this has happened and analyze this so that we can be logical. We can analyze this in our conscious mind so that we can address this from our wisest self. What if the person that you had to disconnect from were to pass? How would you handle it? And does, does this mean that maybe we shouldn't be disconnecting? If we're afraid of, of getting to that point, does that mean maybe we shouldn't disconnect uh, from those persons that are, that are toxic? Uh, what makes this theme especially perfect today for me is that uh, today I got a phone call and it was my brother. And you already knew by the odd timing of the phone call and the fact that he texted me before he called me to let me know he was going to call me, this was going to be bad news. And he gets on the phone and he says, hey, how you doing? And I'm like, I'm doing great. Fantastic. Amazing, actually. And he, he goes, really? <laughs> I said, yeah, actually, I'm doing amazing. Like, this is like the best day. And he's like, oh, wow. Well, <laughs> I'm going to have to ruin that for you, you know? So he kind of had that, are you sitting down energy? And so I already knew it was going to be bad news. And I started to feel that, that nervous feeling you have in your heart when your heart starts beating. And he says, uh, you know, I got a call from mom who I'm no contact with. And he said, it turns out that your biological father died. Apparently he was found dead in California. And he went on with a couple uh, details of who's trying to get in contact and that I would be next of kin because I was his child. And um, my mind goes to my relationship with this man. And he was not close to me growing up. And by that, I mean, he wasn't involved in his child's life uh, for whatever reason. I remember uh, talking to him on the phone when I was a kid and him telling me that he had been gone for a while because he was incarcerated. Um, I remember uh, reconnecting with him as an adult before I moved to South America to go on my, um, my missionary tour there. Um, he and I, when we would talk, always got along well. Um, he uh, opened up some family secrets to me. But um, 
but we were never close. He never did much for me as, as a kid for, for whatever reason, whatever he was involved in. Um, I never carried any bitterness or animosity toward him for that. Um, but uh, although we had connected a few times as adults, there was this one particular time, um, and I had given him a ride before when he had asked me for one, but there was one particular time was the last time that I talked to him. And it was about a year and a half ago, and I was in the gym at nighttime, and I want to say he called me, and so I had my earphones in, so I picked up the call, and it was him. Hey, he says, <laughs> where are you at? And I'm like, I'm at the gym right now. Now, granted, this is a guy I don't have a very close relationship with, but we had sort of been rekindling a little bit. And he goes, okay, uh, yeah, I'm just checking because, you know, I'm downtown and um, I got kicked out of my girl's house. So I'm just like walking the streets downtown here. I just kind of need a ride. And so I was faced with that moment that so many of us have been in, this moment of having to decide if you will jump up, uh, put down what you're doing, to care for the wants and needs of a family member who's related to you by blood, or if you will mm, set some boundaries and say, mm, maybe I shouldn't be jumping up to take care of uh, your situation right now, but I should continue to care for myself. And so I, I decided that in this case, um, I didn't like where this was going. What can happen when we make ourselves too available, too accessible uh, to certain family members is they can start to take advantage. They can become users. And so they can feel like you are the type of person who's desperate for approval, who wants to please, who wants to uh, have this close relationship and connection with uh, family members. And so whenever they call you, you will be there. Whatever they need, you will provide. Uh, whatever they want you to do, you will do it. But see, that can be a little bit of a compromising position to put yourself in. Because if you live your life that way, uh, you are living with a lack of boundaries. People in your life shouldn't feel like whatever they need you to do, you'll do for them. Unless these are individuals who represent a select few that you have chosen to give that to. Uh, this would be your minor children and, and anyone else who you feel this is a worthy energy investment. Chances are they've shown you that time and time again, they have that same attitude and that same energy of giving to you. In this case, this is a man who has literally never given me anything. <laughs> <laughs> is that I have given him things before. I have bought him things before, but he has never done anything for me. And now he's asking for me to leave whatever I'm doing and come find him when he's out doing why he's even in my city. I had no idea. So, uh, so I had to make a decision. I was going to handle the situation. I decided I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to go. It's time to set some boundaries. So I just said, uh, no, you know, I don't think I can help you out. I'm, I'm at the gym right now. And he said, okay, no problem. No worries. And he hung up. That was it. That was the last time we talked. So this is perfect. Because now that he is deceased, and I just found out today, we can analyze this question. Do I regret not staying in contact? Do I regret setting boundaries, prioritizing that workout in the gym when, I mean, hey, it's hundreds of workouts, right? And we only have a limited amount of time with those whom were related to by blood. So do I feel like maybe I should have put down the barbells and the self-care, put that aside a little bit and ran out there 
and been there for him have maybe one last hurrah, maybe connect in some way. Maybe if I would have been more involved in his life, could I have helped him, even prevented him dying at the young age of 59 years old? So now we can analyze it. Now is the perfect time for me to give this address so that I cannot be accused of having a lack of empathy for a person's situation when they lose a parent. And so the answer is no. I do not feel regret. I feel the opposite. I'm glad I did what I did. It doesn't mean I'm not sad. When we get news that someone dies, I mean, it's always sad. Even if they were the worst person in the world, which he certainly wasn't. It's sad because it's uh, not something we would wish on anyone. Death is so permanent, so unnatural. But I'm glad, not that he passed, I'm glad that I set my boundaries and I didn't spend my time and my energy and my resources pursuing a connection or a relationship with a person who wasn't prepared or didn't have what they needed to be able to reciprocate my affections. I'm glad that I didn't tarnish my positive perceptions of him with a track record of heartbreak and betrayal, angst, and a history of abuse, uh, feeling unloved and repeatedly abandoned. I'm glad. I can go on knowing that I didn't spend my my time feeling constant disappointment that he wouldn't grow. Constant disappointment that no matter how much I put into him, no matter how much I tried, no matter how much I taught him or told him or tried to guide him and steer him and protect him, he wouldn't progress. I'm glad that I didn't spend my adult life trying to help another adult codependency with their life when in reality I may not have been able to help someone who wouldn't help themselves. In reality, I may not have been able to prevent him from dying young. When you dedicate your life to try to help people that aren't trying to help themselves, it ends in defeat for both of you. And when they pass, you will be mourning their life and they will be at peace and you will be mourning the loss of your time, of your energy, of your resources, of your hope. Your hope is an energy investment that you're putting into a person. You're giving and giving and giving and all that. And eventually they will continue their pattern of reckless decisions, of self-destructive behavior, and you will lose them. My biological father isn't even the first person I've lost to mental illness that, that was dear to me or loved. What can happen if you are doing all of that and you're giving all of that and then you're faced with this moment of getting that call and then you find out they're gone, you can actually feel like a failure. You can actually feel like a failure for the time and the efforts and the resources that you had to put in and the loss of dreams. I'm glad that I didn't continue investing and investing and investing 
into something that wasn't going to yield results. I'm grateful for that. In reality, it's actually a lot easier to receive the news that your loved one has died when you're disconnected from them than if I were enmeshed in a codependent relationship with that person. If I were basing my whole reality, identity, and validity on how well they were doing and how, 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 how I was keeping them going, because that would be crushing. To get that call at that time and in that situation, that would be crushing. It's easier when you weren't connected with the person. Because now I'm free to just mourn the positive perception I had of him, the good relationship we had. I know that he's at peace now. So when you get there, Instead of saying to yourself, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. Right now. It would be better to actually visualize so that you can process the answer to that question. Because we fear what we don't know. And so if you stay in the perpetual state of just not knowing, what you're going to do when that time comes, when someone you love dies that you had to cut off, then you stay in a perpetual state of fear. And that state of fear allows you to be controlled because they can always use that on you. Hey, what if I die? What if I die? See, now you have to come over here and you have to come do what we, what we want you to do. In other words, keep exposing yourself to abuse or misuse, or mistreatment, or neglect and abandonment, because I've got this thing on you, and it's that you fear what will happen if I pass. So I'm telling you, diminish that fear now by, by going ahead and living in that future in your mind. Take yourself there through meditation and visualization. Take yourself there. Ask yourself, what would I do? How would I handle it? Picture yourself being able to Handle the information with grace, with peace. Taking time to process the information and doing what's logical, what's sound, what's beneficial for yourself and for others. One of the ways that we can get through these types of situations, these losses, is by having the power of reprocessing. So it might sound strange or even like it... Um, lacks a bit of decorum, but when we suffer loss, to reprocess, instead of focusing on everything that was lost and everything that is bad or, or is too difficult to handle about the situation, uh, such as, I'm so alone, I'm so weak, I have nothing now, I have no one now, that was my one and only. Instead of thinking like that, Proper reprocessing is to ask yourself, what's good about this? Or why is this a good thing? Now, again, this may seem uh, that's inappropriate uh, when someone dies, but this is not a conversation we're having out loud. This is something we're asking inside of our mind to halt the rumination of the subconscious. Because the subconscious is happy to ask uh, uh, detrimental questions. And when you're asking detrimental questions to the subconscious mind, it will give you detrimental answers. So why me? Why does this always happen to me? It's going to give you detrimental answers because those are detrimental questions. They're not going to help you. In order to stabilize emotionally, a more beneficial question is to ask yourself, what can I find in all this darkness that is light? What is actually good about this? And one of the things that you might come up with, uh, for instance, is that at least you know the person is not suffering. Uh, for instance, for many who deal with mental illness, such as narcissism, borderline personality disorder, um, often they're not living well. Uh, not internally, at, at least. Um, so if you were to lose 
uh, someone to death who internally had a lot of turmoil, at least we have the peace of knowing that they're not suffering anymore and they're not having to uh, try to uh, medicate, self-medicate that suffering with alcohol and drugs, finding themselves falling deeper and deeper into addiction. And knowing that they're not in a perpetual cycle of victim mentality and injustice. Knowing that they're not being tempted to get into a reckless behavior, criminal activity, promiscuous behavior in an effort to find some type of relief or connection. But to know now that they're gone. And the spiritual mindset is, this is out of my control. This is in the hands of the divine now. So it's good for us to ask ourselves how we can reprocess the situation. We want to reprocess the situation. Focus on what is acceptable about this. Because so much of it, 99.9% .9 is unacceptable right? when we're grieving. We want to focus on that little tiny fraction that is acceptable, that is good about this situation. Another issue that might be holding us back is the feeling of guilt. And so we have to recognize guilt as being an expression of our own goodness. The reason why we feel guilt for someone or something is because we've done something to violate our, our own values. We've done something to violate our own values. So if you recognize that you truly have violated something that is right for you, then it's reasonable that you would allow yourself to feel some guilt. You would allow it because that guilt is your expression of you being a good, a valiant person and knowing that you didn't live up to your own standard of goodness. Uh, but once the guilt goes beyond uh, what's really necessary for you to express uh, that mourning over your own violation of your values. If in reality, you haven't done anything wrong, then it's time to mitigate that guilt by looking at what the justifications are for your actions, why you did what you did. Especially when it comes to the concept of having to cut off a loved one, then we want to keep in mind that they've actually put us in a position. They've put us in a position where we couldn't continue the relationship, especially when you're dealing with a narcissist. The narcissist makes having a relationship with them untenable because the only relationship they will accept is one where they are not accountable, where they will not respect your boundaries. So they're not accountable and they're not going to respect your boundaries, which means they don't respect you. And if they don't respect you, then they can do anything to you. And by the way, they're not accountable. That's an unsustainable relationship. It is not possible to make that relationship dynamic work unless you are willing to be abused, which is being hurt, harmed, depleted, and constantly traumatized by another individual, even to the point of death. Uh, or if you're willing to fight, which could lead you into a perpetual cycle of fighting, because if you fight a person to stand up for yourself, but they keep disrespecting you, then they're going to fight back. And then so you're fighting and they're fighting and both people are fighting. And then you're going to go to sleep, wake up the next morning, and instead of disconnecting from them, continue to fight. So, so you're left in a situation. And by the way, with fighting, you can end up harming them or getting yourself harmed worse as a result of them fighting back. And by the way, the narcissist will uh, accuse you or say, imply that they're actually defending themselves, even though you were defending yourself. So now you're in this reactive abuse situation and trying to point the, in the blame. And so it's a, it's a real mess. So again, you're, you're only left with those two options in a relationship with an abuser, a narcissist, or an attacker. You can fight or you can take the abuse. It's all the same thing if uh, there were an assassin who were coming to kill me, then I, I really have two choices, right? I can let him kill me or I can try to fight back, right? Uh, I, obviously, if there were any way for me to avoid them, that would be the best option. If there are any way for me to disconnect, that would be the best option. If I fight with them, I can get hurt. They can end up getting harmed as well. If I try to uh, 
uh, allow them to do whatever they're going to do to me, then that ends in my harm or death. You see how it's an, it's an impossible situation. So, so once you make the decision to disconnect, you have to recognize that that was the best decision that you could have made at that time. That was the absolute best decision that you could have made because there was no, they weren't giving you any other option that was reasonable. Does that make sense? Were well, you there now? Testing audio. Yeah, once you're given, you're put in a situation where you're not, you have no other options, then disconnection is sometimes the best option. So if it does so happen that the person you disconnected to gets sick or they die, you will have to deal with that when you come to it. There's no sense in stressing out about it, but it could be reasonable for you to find the answer to the question. What would I do? How would I handle it? So that you feel a little bit more prepared when the time comes.